Hello and welcome to the Thursday episode of the 905er. My name is Joel McLeod. I'm Roland Tanner. And here we are back in the thick of it all. Uh, this Tuesday was our uh, we had the uh, our guests uh, Andrea Grabance and uh, Pat Murphy, both of the uh, halt the two Halton uh, school boards, uh, to talk kind of about uh, what 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 the lay of the land is uh, almost one school year into a full on COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, shutdowns, openings, lockdowns, distance learning, the whole shebang. And as we're recording it, we got more news coming down the wire. Uh, that, that surprised us. Um, we got word. There, for, uh, let's back it up because it, it was a, it was a roller coaster of emotions and events, especially if you were a parent with a child in the school system in, in the 905. So, a uh, letter came down, uh, uh, from the ministry saying basically, essentially our schools are safe. They're going to be open. We're going to be a okay. Um, just follow the protocols and everything should be fine. Okay. 24 hours later, nope, can't do that. We got to go into shutdown. We're, we're closing the schools uh, indefinitely, indefinitely post April break. Um, yeah, my head is still spinning from this complete 180 within less than 24 hour uh, timetable. Uh, what, what, what is, what's your take on this, Roland, as somebody who doesn't really have a stake in the education system, but <laughs> certainly has a stake in politics? Yeah, yeah, I don't. Uh... I'm one of the fortunate ones who doesn't actually have to change my entire schedule, life, whatever, uh, based around the whims of the provincial government. Um, but, uh, boy, what a mess. You know, I mean, like, literally a letter going out one day uh, and then the complete opposite is being saying, said the next. So, so one day we're supposed to believe that schools were safe on Sunday, but on Monday morning um, were not safe enough um, to be open. Not only after the April break, but for, for any time in the, you know, <laughs> until further notice. Um, well, I can almost picture uh, that conversation what, what going, changed? I can picture that conversation happening where they sent out the letter and then Dr. Williams or, or one of his, his staff kind of walked in and said, uh, guys, uh, bad news. I actually just did the math and it doesn't look that good. Uh Oh, uh, it, it's, you know, there, there was one thing that, you know, we, we, we titled the episode, They Don't Know How the System Works. It was, it was a quote that, that, uh, uh, Andrea gave us. Uh, that, I don't think w- words have never been spoken that are more true on this podcast. <laughs> it's clear they do not understand how the education system works. For example, um, my, my child is in, full disclosure, is in the Halton Catholic system, uh, but we got a word from our board that the schools are going to have to be, remain closed one extra day uh, on the Monday because they have to use that as the day to get uh, all the pieces of technology out to the families that are going to need them. And so they said, we can't, you know, we just, we need that extra day because everybody's on now on April break. So nobody's going into the schools. The schools are closed. Teachers are off. Nobody's staffing it. So they got to say that Monday, we got to, we got to take that as a gimme day, a mulligan and use that to get uh, the, you know, I, I believe Pat said it was 200,000 pieces of technology that they have to hand out to, to, fa- to, yeah, fa- uh, he, to he mentioned, he in, in effect, I mean, you, you asked him that exact question, you know, what happens yeah. if you're given almost no notice to, to close down? I said, well, you can do it, but it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look pretty necessarily. <laughs> so, we, uh, but here, here's a kicker is there's also this, not this, uh, the, the Friday following is a scheduled PA day. So my, you know, my kid, uh, only has three days of class in a seven day week. Um, you know, the, the, it, the I, I, you and I were talking before we recorded and we're just, you know, you've seen the hashtags fire leche going about and, and I don't want to be too mean, but here's the thing. If you're, if, can you imagine if like Apple decided to do a product launch? And you had one of their developers, one of their vice presidents stand up and say, you know, our newest, the newest iPhone is so fantastic and super awesome and it's so safe to use and it's, and it's, you know, the safest for your online security ever. You should go out and buy it right now. Uh, it's super, super fantastic. Awesome. We're so good. So proud of it. And then 24 hours later, you say, Oh no, we have to recall them all from this, from the shelves due to a, ma- a catastrophic failure of the, of the programming. That 
that vice president would probably never be heard from on an Apple stage again, if not probably just outright fired uh, right right there on the spot. It, I'd love to know the, the, the process of communication that brought that to happen. So the minister must feel like a complete idiot today. Um, well, he, if, if he has enough awareness about his own career to, to, to follow that kind of thing, um, you know, to, to basically be con- contradicted by your premier within a matter of hours in the most sort of profound and obvious fashion. Well, he was in the, clearly, he was in the press he was overruled. Well, he was in the press conference. That's the, that's what I don't get is he sent out the letter and then 24 hours later, he stands in front of the microphones to say, Oh, guess what? We're still close. We're going to close you down. And it's like, who, who is running the show? And that, what I found interesting is I watched that press conference and all the, th- you know, you had, uh, Rob Ferguson, Laura Stone and, and Travis Dinaj, uh, but all veteran Queens Park journalists and they pretty much were all saying the exact, they asked the same question. Why, why is it that you, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing on this file? And at this, you know, I can understand at the start, you, you're, things are moving rapidly. It's, it's confusing, but, um, at this stage, this is, again, this is the third lockdown, third time's the charm. This, this should be dust off the old playbook and just read it script verbatim at this point. And this government is still mucking it up. And this has been, I mean, this is the most obvious and, and embarrassing example of, of the left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing. But we had that all through the summer when the schools were first uh, moving towards reopening with the, you know, the the kind of weekly changes of a direction, the weekly or even daily announcements, uh, mm-hmm. the announcements made on Friday so that no one would notice until after the weekend. The, you know, it's been... A complete mess, and, and this isn't normal for government. I mean, we uh, most people have a fairly low, uh, you know. Unfortunately, we live in a world where many people have a very low opinion of, of government and government efficiency and things like this. But I don't think this is normal. There are chains mm-hmm. of command. There are uh, uh, ways in which decisions get communicated so that ministers don't tread on each other's toes and announce contradictory things. Uh, but this is, I mean, I. I I suspect it's 50% Lecce's fault and 50% the Premier's. I, f- I feel like the Premier is a very sort of reactive, impulsive person. You know, he's not really much of a planner. Um, and he'll just say, OK, shut everything down, you know. And that, he thinks that's leadership, um, whereas it's just stupid. <laughs> I mean, well, and also shutting down is the wrong thing to do. The way he reaches a decision is the wrong way to reach a decision. Well, here's the thing, if you, you know... We've talked about it before. Around the world, you see like places like New Zealand and Australia. Uh, their their countries decided to take leadership. They decided to plan. They said we're going to do an act, you know, a, a an actual lockdown. There's, you know, you're not going to be able to move around from place to place. Um, you know, and we're going to shut down travel inside and outside the country. We're going to, this is going to hurt people. It's not going to be pleasant. It's going to hurt. We're going to get, but it's, you know, long, short-term pain for long-term gain. And, you know, now we've got pictures of people partying it up on Australia's beaches because they, they, they paid, they paid their dues and now they're able to reap the benefits. I was literally re- just, um, I wasn't actually listening to this podcast, but I, I was, reading the notes for an Australian podcast. And the notes were, oh, it's a strange week this week because we're not actually with each other together to to um, to record it. We did it over Zoom. That's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, they really are on the other side of the world because, you know... But uh, <laughs> that was the unusual thing, not not the not the Zoom calls and <laughs> the video no, no, chats and the rest of it. But that's... So, that's yeah, a, it's like they did it right. They had... We, decisiveness and i'm I'm not i'm not going to lay that entirely at at doug ford's feet uh that's uh, that is unfair to him part of that is justin trudeau i think hindsight is 2020 we should have locked down the borders tightly um we didn't we still we still really haven't um and we're still letting these trickle and and people kind of slipping in through the cracks um because maybe it's our canadian politeness we're just we just we can't say no too bad uh, we, we can't do that. We're, at this point, we're, 
we're we're, tri- we're tripping we're tripping to the to the finish line. We're not we're not going to crawl across the finish line gracefully or with our head held high at this point. I think we have to to concede that. Um, we are going to get there. I, I believe we are. It's it, it's just it's going to be a mess, and we're going to have we're probably going to have to have somebody help us across that line, whether it's the Americans or our, our friends in Europe or, or or whatever have you. But we, I, my worry is we are losing the 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 plot on this. Um, but let's let's move on to uh, sunnier topics. Well, our second story this week um, is uh, provincial newspapers. Joan Little, who, who writes for the Spec, and she was mentioning um, that the city of Burlington has been given quite a big chunk of money um, to do up its civic square. So 1.9 million from the federal government, 1.6 from the province, and then Burlington has to pay its own 1.3 million, which takes us to uh, maths not being my strong point, about $5 million um, to make the civic square more attractive than it is at present. Now, for those people who aren't from Burlington, the civic square is a Currently, quite windswept uh, little corner between um, the <laughs> between a pub and city hall, um, uh, where staff tend to have uh, the lunch. Actually, is that right? Am I getting my geography wrong there? No, it is. It's between it's between the pub. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. well, the city's not paying for it, but I mean, I guess it's all taxpayer dollars, one way or the other. Um, I have something of a problem with that civic square because it a whole bunch of things in Burlington have have revolved around it, almost quite literally revolved around it. Um, because of the, it's a square that s- people in the city don't use very much. Uh, staff use it. There are some picnic tables. Um, uh, now, in essence, if you if you want to get together in Burlington, you tend to go to Spencer Smith um, because. Big park by the lake, fantastic views. Great, um, great for podcast strategy sessions. Yeah, and much, yeah, exactly right. Uh, we didn't go to Civic Square to talk about it. Um, and much as the, the the pier was was an awfully contentious issue for for years and years on end, now it's there. It's actually a very nice place to sit. Yes, it <laughs> to is. To look back at the city. Um, uh, so this Civic Square, I mean, in the big scheme of things, f- even five million is not. A lot of money in the in. Uh, I, I don't know. People. I just want to know what they plan on doing there. Because here's the thing. Um, I it, it has been. I'll be. I'll give it credit. It has been used for some fun events. Uh, I I my 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 earliest recollection was Sound of Music Festival, which is a free, uh, really exciting like music festival. If you're when this is all over, people and, and COVID is no longer a thing. Uh, definitely come down to Burlington Father's Day weekend. Check out the Sound of Music Festival. It's a great time. But my earliest memory was in high school, grade nine, uh, checking out uh, the Rainbow Butt Monkeys <laughs> playing uh, in the Civic Square, who are now Finger Eleven. So, you know, I, that's how old I am. Um, I became a fan of Finger Eleven before they were Finger Eleven. But anyways, that's, that's kind of what it's for. It's like you got like a little small – Small intimate band gatherings. Um, most recently, it was used um, again be- pre-COVID uh, as a commemoration for uh, one of the members of Walk Off the Earth passed away. So we had a bit of a kind of a, a commemoration for him a- in the uh, in the Civic Square, which was it was nice. Yeah, and I've been um, to a few events there. I mean, there was yeah, a, it, a, a when the uh, the uh, mosque shooting in Quebec City happened. There was a mm-hmm. sort of candlelight vigil the same, same night. Uh, there was other things have been there. Um, uh, so it is used. So I don't want to come across like one of these people who just, who just minds about spending money on anything. Um, however... <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what $5 million is needed to... Like, unless you're going to do like a... It can't cost five million dollars to upgrade. Like, there's nothing to upgrade there. It's just a it's a gigantic interlock brick pad with a water fountain on it and our and our flag pools. I, I've seen and some park benches. Yeah, I mean, I've that's th- it. There have that's been all some is. plans kicking around for for a couple of years at least. 
about a, a facelift. I didn't realize that it was coming down to sort of applications for provincial or federal money. Uh, what I understand stood of the plan, and I can't say I've checked today uh, to see if it's changed, um, is some extra trees, some nicer furniture. Um, yeah, that stuff does add up quickly at the prices that cities pay for things. Um, you know, if you're doing up your backyard and you get your friend in, friend in to do a bit of landscaping on the quiet, um, they charge a different rate to, to the municipal guys, I guess. However, I mean, the, the, the pro, the, that whole area has been a focus for the city. Um, in, in the previous official plan, um, the, one of the main reasons that, that there are two tall towers um, likely on the way at some point or other or, or, uh, at that corner of Brant Street is because the city changed the official plan to basically trade additional height to developers in return for being given a small corner of land. When I say a small corner of land, it really is a small corner. Um, basically a little piece of each corner of those buildings, um, just at ground level, not above ground level, uh, was to be given to the city to kind of enhance the civic square. So you turn the whole area there into a kind of... Uh, the square then goes to the other side of the road, if you like. So um, that's that's the theory. So, so they're, they're giving a couple of metres okay. of... Literally just a couple of metres of, of land at the corners go to the city, um, and in return the, the, the developers get uh, an extra five storeys as of right, uh, which... Um, one of the buildings that was most contentious in 2018 was um, the debate was whether it should be allowed to have 17 stories, which was as of right, or what the developer wanted, which was, I think, 23, 24, something like that. Um, so it's it's a classic case of the city thinking in self-important manners. Like, this is the civic square. This is important. We have to have a good civic square. But most people just do not care. It's an okay space. If you're going to blow five million, blow it somewhere else, it's and don't nice, do deals with developers that nobody wants. It's a nice place um, to go have a have a, your eat your sandwich on your lunch break on a summer day. Um, not you know, here's an idea: turn it into a lot of social distance spacing for the local businesses downtown to enjoy takeout. But you know, nobody's going to listen to this. No, no one in the planning department is going to listen to this episode. <laughs> But like five five million dollars, five million million tax dollars. You know, there there are so many more interesting ways to spend that kind of money around the city because there the one one beef I've always had in Burlington is that everything is downtown centric. Yet you're you're yeah, being yeah, pressured to build out, build 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 keep building up towards the escarpment, build up build up into the green space into the green belt. We need. Um, you know, we need to keep pushing north, yet they're all expected to come downtown for festivals and, mm-hmm. and get togethers. And I mean, yeah, we have that's what kind of what Spencer Smith is for, but wouldn't it be kind of neat to start developing something up north for a different kind of venue? Uh, you know, there, there we have um, City View Park, which was tempor- temporarily rumored to be the site of. Uh, like a soccer pitch for the Pan Am games years ago that fell through, but they still pretty much just leveled the top of the escarpment and built a bunch of soccer pitches. And it's just this big wide open park and it's a lovely park. I've been there, walk my dog around there. It's lovely, but wouldn't it be kind of cool to do something up there to maybe make a venue that you could do, I don't know, like, you know, a street food festival, or you could do, you know, more out, you know, f- films out in the park. Uh, so, you know, like outdoor f- film festival, something like that something that just makes it a little bit interesting, uh, and and it, Burlington a little bit more of an interesting place to live than just oh, let's give you know a slap of paint and uh, you know take the power washer and blow out all the the weeds between the interlock and Civic Square, and uh, you know give some somebody five million dollars. Like, what, couldn't we just think outside the box for just this one time? Five million dollars on on a bit of municipal um, landscaping and and benches and things like that that goes almost nowhere. It, it's incredible. Like the the Elgin Street Promenade thing. I I can't mm. give you a number on that, but I, I the the fairly it's better than what was there before. Don't get me wrong, um, but the fairly sterile 
stone, a grassless, treeless space that was built a couple of years ago. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure that costs at least five million, if not more. And it, it's not. It is better. <laughs> I'm trying to really emphasise the positive and not sound like one of the right. people who moan about everything. Uh, but you know, if you took those five million, and gave them to well, a community here, group here, here. to to build some phenomenal yeah. kind of um, something inventive, something creative, something that's completely right. done from end to end by the community itself, I bet you know, uh, right. I bet they would create something phenomenal with that money. Well, here- Here's the thing, you know, we're talking about how to spend $5 million, $5 million tax dollars, public spaces that are engaging, thought provoking, just interesting. This isn't it. This is, this is just doing bare, and yeah, maybe to give them back the $5 million, say, no, we want 20 million. We want to do, we want to do something really amazing for the public, for the public, for the people of Burlington and even the, you know, beyond the, the borders of Burlington to enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see uh, Montreal's done really well on these kind of community-driven uh, projects, uh, things like um, transforming, um, I can't remember the name, but the, the, the kind of lanes that go at the back of people's houses in Toronto and Montreal and places like that, uh, turning those into really inventive, exciting spaces, cities, Governments are just not really good at this kind of stuff, you know, because they go to the the city bench salesman shop and pick up twenty benches, and I know it's a lot more complicated than that. It's only city planners listening. I'm sorry, I do know it's more than that, but that's kind of how it feels. It comes out on the other end, you know. Like again, talking about the Elgin Street, I think it's better than what was there before. I find it somewhat uninspiring, even with public art they've in, they introduced, things like that. And the public art has a very kind of off-the-shelf feeling to it, too. It's not art by people from Burlington. It's not art from people from anywhere, really. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily resonate with the inhabitants. Uh, and I, 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 this isn't a Burlington problem. This is a, a, a mm-hmm. way government works problem, um, as so many are. Um but yeah, we we do need to do better. We need to get beyond these these kind of things that just uh, that don't bring us together as a community, but but just kind of go, eh, could have been better, you know. Um, uh, and and the point about concentrating on downtown Burlington, which for, again, for anybody who's not particularly familiar with Burlington, you probably do know that the. The city centre is not in the centre of the city. Um, uh, the if you live in North Burlington, it's a quite a hike to get to downtown Burlington, um, uh, and you've got this ruddy great highway or two ruddy great highways going right through the middle, which 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 creates a a physical barrier that is very significant. Yeah, we, we, it does do need to do a much better job of bringing the whole city into into these kind of things. Uh, I could go on about this for ages, but it, it, it's a classic case of, of of that kind of municipal self-love um, that um, that you think about your own doorstep first um, and, and not about the bigger picture, and this seems like a case of that. Um, I'm sure it'll be very nice. I'm just not sure that it'll be a particularly good use of $5 million. Well, why don't we uh, move on to the the next uh, wonderful topic? Because uh, it, it doesn't get, it doesn't get any better from he- well, it does it does, doesn't get better than better than here. Um, uh, our listeners in the nine hundred five, I'm hoping, are aware of a few years ago the the news broke that city of Hamilton was covering up its own its own mess and what a mess it was. Uh, billions of was it gallons? I believe it was uh, of raw of, of raw sewage was being dumped into Coot, uh, Coots Paradise, which is a, a lovely, well, used to be lovely little bit of land uh, that's a part of the Royal Botanical Gardens here in the 905. Uh, that was, you know, there's a uh, you know, it's it's a lovely bit of wetland that you know would have a, a, all sorts of biodiversity, beautiful piece of uh landscape that was protected and that you could go take your walk take your dog walk through it enjoy a nice you know a nice summer day and you know you think hey in a pandemic what beautiful what better way to spend your time than 
walking on the in the nature outdoors until the city of Hamilton for four years dumped its sewage there and didn't bother to tell anyone. Um, now, why are we talking about it now? It was, it was four years ago. Well, apparently, uh, it looks like the mess might still might be back. Uh, in the CBC, uh, there's reports of algae uh, growing in Coots Paradise. The uh, the concern is. Uh, that this is because of raw sewage still leaking into the into the area, which is fe- fueling the growth of the algae. Um, now, p- according to the CBC article, uh, Andrew Grice, who's the director of Hamilton Water, said the city was looking into concerns about the water raised late last week and earlier on Tuesday, but said this isn't a spill. He says it's dark, older algae that may have floated to the surface due to lo- low lake levels and weather conditions. Um he says, he says, I am, quote, uh, quote, I am not concerned. It formed from raw sewage. There's no indication from us. This is a sewage spill. We certainly have collected samples and they're being analyzed by our laboratory right now, he said. Uh, great, wonderful, except that the Royal Botanical Gardens disagrees uh, and Environment Hamilton is concerned. And yeah, I mean, this is just, this shows what happens in the city of Hamilton. When you hide stuff for four years, it's a little hard for us to take you at face value and you say, you know, it's it's good, guys. It's good. Yeah, and the I was just trying to find the 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 quantity of sewage that went into went into Chidoak Creek and then out into Coots Paradise and Lake Ontario. Uh, I can't find it, but I guess once you get to the billions, it hardly matters whether it's a liter or a gallon. Sorry, um, 20, yeah, twenty four billion liters. It says here. So yeah, billion <laughs> with a B. Uh, the um, that. Uh, leak was found in 2018 only because of um, algae or algae like uh, uh, material appearing on the surface of the water. Uh, that's when they found it. Um, and then they continued to, to cover it up for, for years after that. Um, uh, what had happened um, and the amount of, of sewage that they got in. You know, it, it, it uh, it it kind it go it it does beg a question like if you take a step back it begs a question of what is going on in Hamilton's not city council but in city hall the municipality because you have this they're covering up billions of liters of well let's be honest shit and piss pumping into what's supposed to be protected wetlands I mean this this it's it's on the Royal Botanical Gardens property which is there to protect wetlands from this kind of thing. Uh, the city decided to essentially ignore it and, or cover it up or just not do anything about it for four years. They also, um, on the other side of town, uh, knew that the Red Hill Parkway that they built was, you know, not really built well and, and causing people to die. And again, the city, city hall knew this, the city players knew this, but rather than somebody stepping up and saying, Hey guys, we made a mistake. We need to fix this. It's, you know what? Let's just hope that nobody pays attention. Let's, you know, put it in the inbox and just keep putting stuff on top of it and nobody's going to pay attention to it. And, you know, are they, are these two things connected? No, but you know, it's, it's clear that there's a bigger problem in Hamilton of just, Let's look the other way instead of actually fixing the problem. Yeah, the the pattern of of first having discovering that something very serious had gone wrong, and then not telling anybody for a long period of time, is a very disturbing pattern. Um, both of these stories, it literally, they knew that the surface in the Red Hill Valley Parkway was deficient um, for a period of years, I believe. Uh, while people are still driving on it, um, and while, uh, if I remember correctly, people, I can't recall the names, I'd have to go and look it up, uh, were blaming accidents on people driving carelessly or driving too fast. Uh, it's like, no, you put the wrong stuff on the surface of the road. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's, um, t- 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 you know, <laughs> once looks unfortunate, twice looks like... Well, twi- twice looks like incompetence. Because uh, I mean, from what I understand, that this pro- the, this we got this mess with Coots Paradise because a valve wasn't fully shut, and it just started leaking sewage into uh, Shadow Creek. And you know, the entire time, it's, it's, and nobody thought to check for four years. It's, like apparently, the story goes, 
because Valve was left open for four years and just allowed to keep doing this because, you know, in four years, nobody's going to bother to do a, just a regular safety check. And, oh, we're going to have to review our process. Like, no, this isn't a review of process. This isn't like, oh, we, you know, you know, hey, hey, we need to add an extra item on the checklist. This is just basically four years, nobody did their job. Four years, nobody said, hey, you know what? I'm going to go check on the maintenance of, you know, a, a, a major piece of infrastructure. Um you have to ask yourself, why is that? Like, why, why is that nobody thinks about, about this? And, and then to find out, like, literally, we are up shit creek without a paddle. <laughs> yeah. And it, you've got something with a single point of failure that if that thing is not, uh, handled properly, you have a four billion, uh, liter sewage problem, uh, a toxic waste problem. Uh, that's, bad design to start with but you know cities deal with aging infrastructure and yeah. whatever but yeah people should be losing jobs for this sort of thing and I, i'm not the first person in the world to say fire person x fire person y but this is big big stuff yeah. like clearly we're, we're going to be dealing we're going to be dealing with this mess we're going to be dealing with this mess for years possibly even generations to come like to clean up like 20, 25 billion liters of raw sewage. Like, this isn't a tiny mess. This is like a, you know, it, it's, 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 it's astounding to, I'm trying to wrap my head around it and I can't. And I'm trying to think, like, how do you go about fixing this? And I'm sitting going, like, I don't know, like, how, I don't know how you clean up raw sewage in I wetlands. Mean, you, you, you don't. I mean, the, yeah. the sewage is gone four years ago. Uh, the damage is what you're left with. Um, and the damage may be the algae. You know, that may be a symptom of of, of four years of, of human waste going into uh, that creek. Uh, yeah, it, and it brings just as a sort of final <laughs> a final complaint of the day uh, to the climate. I, someone was was um, uh, commenting on Twitter today about. Uh, how every city in Ontario, pretty much, I don't, there may be cities who didn't do this. Pretty much every city in, in Ontario in about two, latter half of 2018, 2019, made declared climate emergencies. Uh, this isn't quite the same thing, but it's, it's to do with the environment and how we care for the environment. So, so it's related. Those climate emergency declarations have been followed in subsequent years by a sum total of pretty much nothing changing with regard to uh, transportation, uh, uh, increased use of cycle lanes, uh, paying for cycle lanes, investment in environmental things. You can, if you can find a city in Ontario that's made, well, certainly in the 905, that's made significant progress on those items following the declaration of an emergency, <laughs> Yep. Uh, then I would like to know who they are. And please do write and then let us know if your city's done something phenomenal. I know, again, speaking of Burlington, it's unfortunate for the Burlington Council that I know most about what they get up to because I live here, um, that they declared a, a, a climate emergency and gave it a budget of zero dollars to deal with it. Um, that kind of told you everything that we needed to know about that. It's very easy to make these these declarations that, look great i'm not even sure that they do like great but i think they think they look they, great they only, they only look great they only look great if you follow up with it and you stop shit from happening like this uh it's you know, talk th is this cheap is, you know and it, it, it discredits and, the whole process again and again it comes back as it always does to why do people hate politicians so much because of games like this that your your actions are just failures of a fairly epic scale if you're talking about the, the Coots Paradise story. And on the other hand, other side of the register, your 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 kind of reforms, your changes are, are just words. Um, and sure, words are better than nothing sometimes, um, but symbols can be important. But climate emergency is, you're using the words of that we've been using all year with COVID, an emergency, uh, disaster, uh, like fund, you know, fundamental change. If you're going to use that language, you better follow it up with a budget bigger than zero dollars. Okay. Well, I think we're going to leave it at that for this week. Uh, thank you to everyone for listening. We hope to hear from you next week. Take care. All right. <laughs>
that's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns, or ideas for future episodes to our email, info at 905er.ca. We'd love to hear from you. You can help us keep 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.